Okay, so I think we should get started. Um, so kia ora koutou. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the AIRA webinar about AI and healthcare. And my apologies for the link. Um, I did have it set up and then um, it didn't work. So um, we had to make a quick shift. Um, we're very lucky today to have two people talking about their own experiences in AI and healthcare research. Um, the Kevin Ross and Sanya Samara Singh. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about each of them and then talk about the format for today. Um, so many of you will uh, already know Kevin. He's the SVP of product enablement for Orion Health, a healthcare platform managing over 100 million patients worldwide. He's also a fellow of Health Informatics New Zealand and chair of the advisory board of the Institute of Natural, Artificial and Organizational Intelligence. Uh, Kevin was CEO of Precision Driven Health from 2016 to 2023. Um, he was also part of the COVID-19 response uh, modeling team to Puna Matatini, uh, which received the 2020 Prime Minister's Science Prize and a finalist in the, uh, for the 2021 IT Professional of the Year. Um, Kevin has previously been an academic, a consultant, and a member of the Digital Council of New Zealand. So our second speaker is Sanja Samra Singh. So many of you will also be familiar with um, Sanja's work research um, over a long time here in New Zealand. Um, so she's a professor in AI and complex systems modeling at Lincoln University and head of Complex Systems, Big Data and Informatics Initiative at Lincoln University. Uh, she graduated with a master's and PhD from Virginia Tech uh, in mechanical and civil engineering. And she started AI applications in 1991 with a 10 year project to automate the New Zealand power network. It was the first of its kind in the world. This was funded by TransPower NZ Limited. Um, her lifelong interest in biology led her to integrate AI and engineering in solving health problems um, since 20, uh, 2008. So Sandra is a fellow of Modeling and Simulation Society of Australia and New Zealand, and she's been a visiting fellow at Oxford University, Stanford University, and Princeton University. So the format for today is that Kevin is going to lead off he'll give a talk of approximately 30 minutes. Um, and then we'll have five minutes of questions, um, you know, specific to his talk. Um, then Sandra will give another talk of about, about 30 minutes and we'll have five minutes of questions specific to Sandra's uh, presentation. And then we'll open the floors, floor for general questions. Um, if at any time you'd like to put a question in the chat, please go ahead and do so. Um, but they will be addressed after the presentations rather than during the presentations. So kapai, everyone's happy? Looks like it. Okay, Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Jill. Nice to see you all. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share a few of my experiences. What I'm going to do today is a fairly rapid overview of where AI is interesting in healthcare at the moment. And I'll tell a little bit of the story of Precision Driven Health, which has just come to the end of our seven-year partnership, and then talk through a few of the case studies and experiences from there. Um, so it's a pretty high-level uh, run through here, but hopefully it'll be enough to give you a sense of where, where things are at in the health sector. Um, so Precision Driven Health, um, sort of introducing on the on the right here, the screen here, is is a partnership that's been run for the last seven years, involving a lot of organisations in New Zealand. Um, there've been almost fifty organisations involved in various capacities over that time, um, and we've had about a hundred different collaborations, all in health data science, and they're generally collaborations between public and private sector. Um, so that's sort of where I come from. Um, before I get into PDH itself or Precision Driven Health, I just wanted to give you just sort of a really high level sense of the different areas where AI is interesting in healthcare. So the first sort of obvious area, if you like, is diagnosis, including imaging. So there's a lot of applications out there today, and I've went into a few of 
few of the companies doing interesting things in that space, where essentially we're using AI to do what human readers used to do. So whether that's a dermatologist uh, reading a picture of a mole or um, someone reading an X-ray, a radiologist type of application, there's a lot of applications where AI has, has essentially got to the point of being equal to or more accurate than humans on a sort of a comparison basis. And that's in, it's a really obvious area. It's a fairly discrete activity that we're asking AI to help us with, which is, you know, reading a particular image where there's a well-labeled data set that we can leverage from the past and that's representative of the way that we want to use things in the future. And so obviously that makes it a really good candidate for training uh, models with, with machine learning and the technology that's available today. Obviously, diagnosis is much more than just imaging. There's lots of diagnosis around uh, lab results and, and other things as well. And you see more and more AI being in, involved in the processing of that data and even in just the management of people's health records for that data. Moving to a completely different area. So AI for drug discovery is a, is a major theme of what's starting to be really interesting and active today. And that's largely because of a lot of what happened in drug discovery is a fairly mysterious data mining exercise where you've got really wide ranging data sets. Um, you've got huge data like genomics um, and, um, and different sort of structural information about drugs and their side effects. And so because of that, you've got a huge scale of computation required. And often you're looking for patterns, sort of a needle in a haystack um, style that we've traditionally had really advanced capable computers and people kind of combining together. And all you're seeing in this space is really AI just taking more and more of a computational role in terms of actually helping people go through the, the exercise of discovering the patterns. And so that, that sort of illustrates to me Probably the key point here is that machines are really good at pattern recognition and wherever we've got data sets where pattern recognition is the key, one of the key places for insight, AI is starting to have a bigger, bigger and bigger role. A sort of different kind of space is the early detection space and this is quite interesting for different reasons in health. One of the things we know from healthcare is that we've traditionally been focused on people who are not well and collecting data at a point of care where people traditionally are having some symptoms that indicate that they're not normal. What that means is we've got much better data and history of people at points of inflection where they're, where they're becoming diagnosed for something, but we don't actually have a really good data sets of a healthy population. What's happening now is we're all wearing devices that record all this data about us even when we're not unwell and that's opening up a whole new area of interesting research about what's normal we don't really know what blood pressure does all the time with everybody and same with heart rate and these sorts of things we're just getting to the point where we can track so many different things about people because they're wearing these devices and willingly sharing that information with various technology companies and research institutes that then get to go and understand that data. And again, there's not a whole lot really happening in active AI in the sense of managing health yet, but it's becoming obvious there's a few use cases where things like the Apple Watch has been approved to be a medical device for certain types of detection of um, heart issues because we've found enough data to actually recognize that. But I think the reality is we're just starting this pattern of people collecting and sharing that level of data and we'll see more and more examples of probably smaller and smaller sort of use cases in terms of you know more sort of narrow e exceptions that we can see through that, um, that data. And obviously AI is key to helping us actually crawl through all that data. Probably the most interesting area that I sort of see AI becoming a real part of healthcare is what I think of as, as the assistant space. So this is where you can think of AI as the third person in the room where you've got a clinician and a patient who are having a conversation. And I've seen various demos of this in different contexts in the, in the last 12 months where, especially when you combine different elements of technology here, so things like the ability to record voice and to transcribe that and then to code that language into medical codes and then take things right through from essentially listening into a conversation to it looks like you've just suggested this person has this condition did you think about asking this question 
would you like to prescribe this? Did you think about this other aspect? So it's having having that sort of AI listen into the conversation, transcribe and take away the bit that no one likes, which is the writing things onto computers, um, and actually sort of having that sort of intelligence as, a, as an extra person in the room. And I think this is an unlimited area for future because it's got that really good sense of sort of a safe, responsible situation where a clinician still has the ultimate say, but they're relying on technology more and more as they trust it more and more in that kind of care. So, so that's probably where I see the most interesting kind of advances happening right at this point in time. Obviously, robotic surgery is something that's been around for a while in different forms, and we're getting better and better at, at doing this. And obviously, our AI systems are getting better at that sort of that motor skill air, end of the spectrum. So we can see lots of applications coming where essentially, eventually, there'll be a lot of situations where computers are more reliable than humans at, at certain aspects of things like surgical, surgical procedures. So those are some areas of application. Probably the, the one of the things to, ways to look at this is how quickly we're developing certain capabilities to a point where we see them as better performing than humans. And if you think of the sort of recognition areas, so handwriting, speech, images, comprehension and language, these are all areas where actually probably in the last five years, they've all crossed a threshold. The interesting thing is some of them started a long time ago and others seem to have started quite recently, but we're getting to a point where on relatively well controlled areas, we can see that a computer is a better than a, better than a human. And again, I use that term quite carefully that we have to be really narrow in the question to have a computer that's better than a human. But often, especially in situations where we consider it to be, for example, an additional reader of, a, of something, um, we've got the ability to potentially, instead of having two humans a loop, have a human and AI uh, in the loop. And so we're just seeing this technology kind of take that take that step now where quite easily we can see that we're more likely to get the correct answer to a narrowly defined question if we rely on technology. Um, and again, the question is how do you how does that actually translate into the healthcare, which is not one narrowly defined question at a time. It's a whole lot of broadly defined questions. Uh, there are lots of interesting other things. I'm not going to get into all of these, but I think you know there's lots of things that I think are really interesting in terms of the way that we're able to use AI. And you know, a classic example that I sort of think of is that scenario of a rare disease where essentially what we ask a clinician to do is to pattern match. So look at all the data you know about the patient in front of you, all the data you know about what's happening in the world, and give the best idea of what you should do next. Now, computers are really good at pattern recognition. And so if you look, think of the, the process of understanding a person's record versus the general population, and then understanding the latest information about a given condition, computers can help immensely in that exploration side of things. And so there's a lot of sort of, you know, real-time research that you're able to do through AI that previously would have, you know, often taken um, weeks or months to actually get through and find, find all those details to so find those rare things that have happened to someone else that are similar to the patient in front of us. So the, the more we have sort of data systems that link up the patient record to that knowledge base out there, um, the more we're going to be able to see this sort of thing advance. Um, easily raised in all of these things are what can possibly go wrong. Uh, and again, you've all read lots of these, you've all got your own objections and concerns, there's bias in everything we do. There's there's data sharing that doesn't feel like it quite lives up to the promise of our trusted health system that can get involved in here. And we've got lots of stories out there of people doing things they probably shouldn't with data and trusting technology before they probably should. Uh, and so all these things are very real uh, and and they are they are new, but in a sense they're not new. And and I and I and I and I say not new in the sense of, you know, health is one of those areas that's actually got a really robust history of actually understanding ethics, understanding what it means to put the patient first, what it means to uh, deal with ethical challenges, where we've always had situations where people have conflicting interests, conflicting kind of consent uh, setups, and, and you know there, there, are, there are all sorts of interesting things in there. The other thing that's probably worth noting is that our current system isn't great. So we're not really good today at giving exactly the right care to exactly the right person at exactly the right time. 
And so when we say, should I introduce AI into this process, I'm not introducing it to a, into a perfect process and saying, can I automate this against a, a really good system? I'm actually asking the question, will it improve what's happening today? And I think it's a really important but difficult concept for us to work our way through because it does raise all sorts of questions about how you do this but the reality is in healthcare today we don't give great results especially to certain people and uh, you know vulnerable groups tend to have worse outcomes and if we are to reject AI because it's biased we're likely to end up adopting existing biased systems if we're not careful and so I just want to sort of put that in there as, as, as something that we want to keep center in our mind is can we improve the way we give health uh, care today and health advice. Um, lots of barriers that often come. This has come from a, a survey that's been done of AI health workshops that have been run over the last few years and we've asked people what they what stops them from adopting technology and they, none of these will surprise you I don't, I don't imagine you know there's lots of fear of things going wrong there's lots of lack of confidence our healthcare professionals are not necessarily trained to do AI and data uh, sort of data science, and so there's there's lots of things that are that are going on going through people's heads as they as they think about adopting AI into health. And we should think about these when we build our systems to to think how can we overcome those barriers um, in order to get through. So let me give you probably two or three minutes about precision driven health um, because we've been a really interesting organisation I think in the last few years. Um, Jill was our science advisor and on our board um, as 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 part of the partnership. Um, was founded by a big software company, Orion Health, with one of the more innovative district health boards at Wadamata and the University of Auckland. And it was deliberately set up as a collaboration kind of model where we wanted to bring together data scientists with clinicians and software engineers, ultimately to improve health and to produce products that could be actually used in the health system. Um, we've done a whole lot of things over the last few years, and there's a bunch of reports that I'd point you to. I'm not going to go through details, but there's a, um, a partnership report that we published called Better Health Through Data Science that came out uh, early this year or late last year um, that's got a lot of uh, case studies and, and, and lessons learned over, over the life of the partnership. Um, it's available electronically as well as um, there were some physical ones hanging around as well. One of the series we did was called Te Puai Ora, which was talking of looking at the role of Māori leadership in health data science in New Zealand, and this was a really important part of our program. So even though we were a commercially sort of oriented, export oriented partnership in terms of what we were actually trying to achieve overall, we thought it was extremely important, excuse me, to partner with Māori within New Zealand to really understand how could we improve outcomes and engage Māori in the development of this technology and we have some particular um, partnerships that sort of flourish through that and so there's, there's some good um, material in there. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point you to is this uh, living document if you like which is a, a, a practical guide to doing health data science in New Zealand so this is available for everybody to edit so it's um, it's on the Precision Driven Health <coughs> website still um, and it's going to be maintained going forward by um, to photo order is is something that we use um, to really help people to understand what, how do you how do you go through a good data science project um, in the health context in New Zealand. Um, I'm not going to go through too much of the detail. This is probably this may be interesting to the research community. One of the things we did was have a look at who all is doing work in this sort of health data science AI kind of world, and it's a little bit complex. There are lots of different organizations, they overlap a fair amount, they all have slightly different reasons for existing and, and focus areas, but but really probably just worth being aware of, there are lots of players in this space, there's lots of good knowledge out there, um, so if you're, if you're moving into the health space, um, it's well worth linking up with others who have been working in the space. I think highlighted on here are the ones that we work really closely with, um, that's the only reason they've got highlights against them, but um, you know, really quite an interesting and diverse ecosystem in New Zealand that work in this space. So I'm just gonna tell you a few really quick stories of things that were produced through our partnership over the last few years. And again, happy to sort of take questions or, or um, comments as we go. Um, so one of the things that's live now in New Zealand is called the New Zealand Algorithm Hub. Uh, this is something that came about through COVID. We were involved in some of the COVID modeling and recognized that there were lots of models being used in New Zealand that there was a place for 
uh, bringing together some of those models and making them available to anyone. So this is now a service to the health system in New Zealand where we have standardised the models that get used on a regular basis in New Zealand. So if you've got a common calculation or a risk model in New Zealand, you can go to a single website um, to run a model for a single patient, or you can utilize the APIs and build your own application or dashboard that utilizes a common model. This helps us get past a number of barriers and challenges that you've had in the development of sort of models for use in places like New Zealand, where people tend to just read something and think it might be a good idea. So they build their own spreadsheet or website and over time they can be out of date or or not necessarily, no one ever quite knows where they came from or who's looking after them. So this is kind of giving a, a bit of a governance oversight to make sure that they're appropriate for use in New Zealand, as well as a technology oversight to make sure that we're actually, you know, keeping those model up to date um, and using the latest data. So that's New Zealand Algorithm Hub. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in natural language processing, and this is really all about just um, trying to take all the free text that happens in health and make some, uh, get some value out of it. So what typically happens in health is someone summarizes your medical condition at a particularly important point in care. So that might be when you're you know, your GP refers you on to a specialist or when you're discharged from hospital. A lot of the most important information tends to be captured in a, a free text document that, to be honest, has been for years just kept, kept in a PDF um, document library that no one can get to without opening one document at a time and looking for messages one at a time. So by adding some structure to that and some, some metadata to that data, we're, we're opening up a lot of people's health records so that it becomes actually something you could search for or something you could summarize a population over using some natural language processing. Um, we did a whole lot of work on de-identification of data to make it available for research. And this is something we had a lot of help from the Ministry of Health with our Tafata order in terms of actually understanding what the requirements are when you release data to researchers in order to do good research and do, do it in a way that protects personal information so it doesn't release the personal information. But in protecting the personal information, we don't want to take out the valuable information and lots of things can go wrong in that space. For example, minority groups tend to always have their records deleted because we don't want to re-identify people. And if you're unusual, you're easy to re-identify and therefore you tend to be taken out of the record and therefore your population study excludes minorities. And so we've thought really carefully about things like that and had some sort of some clever ways of manipulating the data in a way that we make sure the data is representative of the full population, but not exposing people's personal information when you do that. Um, and this is a really exciting area because we've produced a product out of it that's now being used in different parts of the world. And, and it's sort of come through this whole sort of research partnership in New Zealand. Um, this is actually not directly PDH, but has, has come um, off the back of PDH as the, the team that were involved have been getting into the area of chatbots and understanding, you know, the patient experience or the consumer experience of finding information can be really frustrating. And so what typically has been a, a, a fairly traditional search for information, we're now able to do a much more interactive chat type of experience. And so we're building, this is actually for the Ontario Health System in Canada, we're building basically a chat interface so that people can explore how to find the best services given the condition they're in and the place they're in. Um, and so really interesting work there. Um, similar, um, similar in that this has come off the back of PDH, but um, not directly, which is working with Orion Health and a company called Pieces in the United States to add a patient summary um, a text summary about a patient at a point in time. So trawl through the current information. So Orion Health often provides what's called the clinical portal, which is the record for a patient when a clinician is seeing them. That's a whole lot of tabs and a whole lot of um, uh, cards that are kind of different aspects of the, of the person's information. What we've done is partner with an AI company that can actually translate that into language that has three different levels of understanding. So if you're sending to a medical professional, you get one summary. If you're sending to sort of a lay person who's involved in their care, like a social worker, you get the language slightly differently. And if you're sending to a patient, you, you put it in a slightly different way again. So again, really powerful stuff that's kind of taking together all these different capabilities of actually bringing that AI together. Um, 
there are several examples that we've we've got into a lot of detail in the last few years. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail of any one of these. I just want to sort of take you through um, a handful handful here. So surgical outcomes, um, again, this is an area that New Zealand used to rely on international models a lot. Uh, and what we did was we partnered with a an anaesthetist at Auckland Hospital who was really worried about the fact that the people at the higher end of the risk scale were not well represented by the models that were being used to assess risk. And so these are now models that are, we're deploying in New Zealand that are based on the New Zealand historical records for surger surgeries. I think this is interesting, particularly because it's valuable at both ends of the risk spectrum. So if you're at high risk for a bad outcome from surgery, the conversation is really about, is this the right thing to do at this point in time? Do you understand the outcomes, how your life's going to change as a result, how much time you'll spend in and out of hospital, those sorts of conversations. And if you're, at, if you're at the lower end of the risk spectrum, these are being used to help avoid unnecessary uh, trips. So people have to travel two or three hours across from a rural location in New Zealand just to have a five-minute appointment, five appointment with a specialist, a head of surgery, go home and then come back the following week for the surgery. If they're really low risk, that's not a necessary journey and it, the cost of that incurs on both the health system and the individuals uh, means that we can free up capacity um, and use that more, more wisely for everyone involved. So I think you know risk models are interesting, not just at the high end, but the, the, the low end as well. Um, readmission to hospital is generally one of those things that everywhere around the world is we're looking to avoid. So usually when you discharge someone, you don't want to see them again unless uh, there's sort of planned follow-ups. Um, and so we work with Guadamata DHB to, to build a model to understand, particularly for those who are still in hospital, could we identify those most likely to be readmitted after they've been discharged so that you could give them the right advice and put them into get the right sort of community care around them when they're discharged. Um, so again, these are reasonably standard sort of risk model um, type areas, but there's more and more kind of opportunity for AI to help us really understand people's records and pattern match between the patient I see in front of me and similar patients who have been through the system. Last one that I'll uh, highlight here is, is a project with a, an organization called Te Whanua Waipareira, which is a West Auckland community Māori organization that provide actually a range of services, including health. And particularly what they tend to do is help vulnerable families find the right services that are available for them. And they were interested in sort of in general, how could they use the data that they had to give better advice to the people that they were seeing? And what we really helped them to do was just have a, have a better way of understanding that data. Again, with that general pattern recognition in, in mind, you know, can I recognize that this whanau is similar to others that we've seen? And based on those others, we've seen what's worked really well for them. So again, just Enriching the data and the conversation as, a, as sort of an additional part of the conversation um, becomes a really important area. And obviously, this is something that they can now take forward and, and, and build other sort of recommendation systems and, and, and other things on top of. So I've taken you right through things pretty pretty quickly. I wanted to make one comment <clears throat> that's probably relevant to the research areas is that um, we did quite a bit of work in the area of understanding what people think about the use of their data. And I'd encourage you to read work by Rosie Dobson. Uh, that was, um, she was a, a fellow through Waitamata and the University of Auckland um, who really got quite deep on the question, you know, what do people expect us to do with their health records? What are they comfortable with and what are they uncomfortable with? Uh, she had some really interesting insights. And, you know, I'd, I'd summarize it in a few, few ways. One, that people in general expect us to use their health records to benefit people with in similar situations. However, they're not comfortable with us using, you know, sharing them into commercial contexts um, and even into university contexts and certain sort of barriers around around what's expected and what's not and how much they want to make sure their privacy is protected or their consent is, is honoured. So, so there's a lot of kind of work for us to do as a research society to, to, to really understand, you know, what's appropriate for use and how do you take public on this journey to, to use data more responsibly. But that was a rapid run through and I hope I've... Um, Piqued a bit of interest. I'm happy to take some questions now, and I think we'll come back at the end again for some for more conversation. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin, for a really quick overview of what is going on in New Zealand and what has been done. Um, Jesse, you've got a comment. Would you like to speak to that?
Um, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it's might be a bit windy. Um, I'll just say, yeah, that sometimes I think there's like an unrealistic expectation that AI is going to be perfect, but it just doesn't take into account that even the humans performing the task aren't perfect themselves, and that that human uh, fallacy is kind of the upper limit of what we could expect AI to do. We can't really expect AI in most applications to be better than the human data that we're given. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I mean, there, there are some interesting examples where, you know, you've done the A-B testing of a, a technology versus a human and you go back and look at where they were different and the humans end up revising their diagnosis more than the other way around. So there's certainly there's certain areas where we're not quite sure how the technology does it, but it does do better. But they're they're in quite narrowly defined things like a you know like an image process, these sorts of things. And there's there's also some worrying things in there, like the ability to, you know, predict an ethnicity from a from an X-ray, um, which we don't think humans can do, but computers seem to be able to do. And we're not quite sure what that tells us. Um, there's, you know, there's some weird stuff in there. Are there any other questions for Kevin at this point? Sanja? Um, good question. Um, Kevin, uh, are you wrapping up this project? You, have, you are going up to 2023. Yeah, so Precision Driven Health has come to the end. Uh, so we were established through the partnership program that they used to be supported and is no longer supported by the government. So there is a, a bit of a gap, to be honest. Um, so the partnerships were were public private um, partnerships was the was the program. There's about 30 of them that were run over the last decade or so. Um, and there none of them are being renewed. So oh, what a shame. Renewed. So Kevin, up um I've got a question. You touched on risks in general. What are the um risks in Aotearoa? Uh, you know, are there any specific risks um here? And also, what opportunities do you see that are particularly relevant in Aotearoa? Yeah, I think those two things are coupled. So I think the uniqueness of Aotearoa is the diversity of our population and particularly the treaty and Māori relationship we have. And I think that is a major risk and a major opportunity because we could easily lose the cultural license, if you like, of being allowed to use data in certain ways if we don't get, make sure we are doing things right, doing making sure we trust each other, make sure we are putting the power back into the hands of communities and people um, rather than you know giving it to outsiders to tell us what to do. And so so I think you know that that big risk in New Zealand is, you know, we, we could do someone could do something wrong and it could very quickly go to we no longer trust the health system, we no longer trust those um, involved in data and technology in the health system, and that could lock down the ability to actually bring technologies safely in. Um, so so I think that's that's a risk. It's also it really is also an opportunity. Um I've traveled a little bit outside of New Zealand in, in the last couple of years and been quite struck by the level of interest people have in the way that New Zealand approaches our relationship with Māori and uh, the efforts towards an inclusive, um, equity-based health system. And if we can get this right, we can actually be quite world-leading in this space. And I think that, you know, that that's a, that, you know, means we need to tread um, really carefully and and move forward in partnership, but I think but I think it genuinely is, is that you know that's the most important thing, um, upside and downside for us to really think about is how do we use AI to reduce the equity gap we have in New Zealand and continue to reduce it. Um, temptations always to do stuff that's easy and that probably you know if I double everyone's life expectancy, the gap would double. Um, you know, and so you have to think, what's our technology going to do um, that actually closes that gap over time? Yep, great points. Any further questions at the moment? Okay, I don't see any. 
Um, so Sandra, I invite you um, to give your presentation now. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me get the presentation out. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, let me get the... Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Janet, for the invitation to, to uh, give this talk and welcome everyone. Um, so um, today I will share with you, you know, uh, some um, research we, we have done on AI to detect and detect and cure diseases and improve health. Sandra, at the moment we've got the presenter's view. So oh. I, it's okay, but... Oh, so you see only how I see. I will change that. Uh, Beautiful. Uh, okay. Okay, I can't. I can't move it after that. Side presentation doesn't work after that. Oops. Presentation doesn't work after that. So we've got something in the chat. <laughs> Drag the this... slide deck to the other screen. Sorry? Do you have two screens? Yes. So Hisham has said in the chat, oh. drag the slide deck to the other screen, question mark. <laughs> yeah, okay, I have done that. Let me see that works or not. Yeah, I think it probably works now. Yeah, okay. So anyway, now I can continue. So um, can you hear me? All yep. Right. Yeah. So um, the, the, just a brief, brief background to it. Um, in 2001, there was a decoding of the human genome. And that was kind of the time I got very interested in getting back to um, re doing research in biology. And um, you probably know the double helix, and we are kind of sitting on the DNA, basically. But the human, um, the genome decoding, um, what, what the project did was to find out what's inside. So what you see here at the, um, um, the bottom here is the uh, kind of, if you open the double helix, you have a bunch of letters. And this is pretty much, this DNA is the book of life, basically. It's, it's our blueprint. It has all the secrets to body and its function. And I kind of, um, this, I really like to probe into these secrets, secrets myself. So I'm quite fascinated by these things. Basically, this letter has four, four letters in the alphabet, A, T, C, and G. So very, very simple but it has huge amount of information. So a part of that code, uh, um, we call it gene. So gene is like a word in the book. It, it carries the recipes for proteins and proteins are the machinery of life. So here we go. Now we have everything <laughs> sorted. <laughs> okay, genes make proteins and protein do all the functions. And there are about 30,000 genes in the human body, 30,000. So 30,000 words, pretty much. And they create all sorts of proteins and, and they do all sorts of functions like breathing to kidney function, heart, everything. So um, just this is a brief over, overview and I'll come back to that when it's needed again, right? So AI and health, um, we cover a quite spectrum of health research. Um, so disease detection and genetic and imaging using computer-aided diagnosis systems. And we worked on human and animal, um, and breast cancer, lung cancer, TB, Alzheimer's, and the animal we have TB, mastitis is another infection in dairy cattle. Um, then the, in the, on the cure side for human and animal, we have worked on vaccine development for uh, TB and regenerative medicine um, from biological regeneration perspective. And we also work on getting deep understanding of health and disease through genetics and gene regulation networks and proteins and protein networks. So, um, um, so it's a quite a spectrum. And today I'm going to talk a bit about breast cancer, a couple of studies, and then just, just touch on a few other um, uh, uh, projects that I have highlighted in, in brown here. Um, so um, uh, first I'm going to talk about the computer-aided diagnostic system that we uh, developed a few years ago. Um, New Zealand has one of the highest incidence rates of breast cancer in the world, one in nine. 
So cancer, you probably know, it is due to uncontrolled cell proliferation, creating a mass, a mass of solid tumor. So cells divide uncontrollably, as you can see in this picture, they are dividing all the time. So diagnosis is uh, based um, on uh, clinical diagnosis is based on ultrasound, biological or genetic tests. So we develop a kind of framework that combines ultrasound and genetic. Um, so that is like a one-stop shop uh, if needed. And this is a collaboration with two medical hospitals in Jordan, Queen Aliya Hospital and King Abdullah University Hospital. And um, so basically uh, with ultrasound, we have the usual features of data mining and, and classification. And the genetic side, we use blood. Blood is easier than um, a tissue to make, get information, um, physiological or genetic. And we use blood and plasma. Um, uh, plasma is what carries blood. So idea is that in future, a GP, for example, takes blood and they can get the genetic test done. Perhaps in future, they will have a gadget in the, in the GP's office to get the genetic data. At the moment, they're very expensive. But you know, once you get the data, you can plug it into the model and then get a classification whether the person has cancer or not. Similarly for ultrasound, the clinician can get the ultrasound. And then we are looking for very simple, parsimonious, trustworthy model so that uh, the clinician can make a prediction. So I'll first look at the clinical, um, the ultrasound um, part of the CAD framework. And here's, here's uh, there's some examples of ultrasound. And uh, um, you can see some lighter areas, that's the normal tissue, and darker blobs are the tumors, cancer or benign, right? So um, what in the previous studies, image texture features uh, were, were used as input for CAT systems, these structure features were very complex and used, uh, you need to know advanced um, image processing and so on. It's not easy for, for uh, clinicians to use and complex and large number of inputs. So only a few studies have used morphological features. Morphological features are features of a tumor, the solid mass alone. And, and, and the, the diagnostic accuracy of breast cancer based on morphological mass features alone is about 90% at the time, so accuracy needs to be improved. We just we don't want just to improve the results accuracy, but we also want the model to be interpretable, trustworthy, and simple and parsimonious models and easy to use. So our approach was to do a thorough investigation of the ultrasound images, and if possible, extract new meaningful uh, tumor features uh, for using a new CAD system. So, um, so just to talk a bit more about the ultrasound system. Okay, I'm, I'm showing the same pictures again. So what will happen in a clinical setting is that the clinician will have a look at the, the images uh, alongside some, um, some parameters. So if you look at this yellow uh, highlighted area, they are the features that they will extract from the images about the mass tumor mass, and there are some other general information here as well at the bottom and top, but this is basically what they are looking. So they are looking for the shape. Is it regular or not? not. If you look at this here, you know, you can see it's not very regular and there are some that are very regular. Uh, border for other one, is it a blur or distinct? You can see some of the borders are quite blur here and some are quite distinct. Uh, micro classification, are there the calcium deposits in the, in the tumor? Or the, like these are the calcium streaks. Some other will be the blood level, you know, is the blood going into the tumor? That means it, it has advanced. So you can see these red dots, that means this image has, it shows that there is blood and so on. So there are 11 um, parameters they use. And what we did was we took those 11 and then, then codify according to their description, like one or two, uh, if its uh, shape is regular, it's one, irregular two, and so on. So for all the variables, we developed a coding system. And then we also wanted to find out, are there any, is there anything else we can do to improve uh, the accuracy, like a new, new feature? So um, we got um, 100 ultrasound images, 50 healthy and 50 um, uh, uh, not healthy. 
uh, you know, like when they're getting data is the hardest thing. And, um, but they're reliable. Um, that's the most important thing in this, uh, in this research. So um, we looked at all the images and very carefully, and we found that the benign tumors are much more regular, uh, like all kind of shape, and the cancerous tumor is very irregular and so on. So we came up with the a feature called central regularity degree to capture that that um, that possibility. That means there's the central area is not regular. So we CRD is now the Z, the minimum distance in the middle, and the and the and the width. Um, so this is a very easy, simple image routine algorithm processing algorithm, and it will immediately very quickly give you this information. And we also introduce the width to depth ratio of the of the tumor, which is simply again x and y. So all these measurements are very readily can be readily made available. So we, so now we put all the previous table I showed you, and we also put the age, and also these two features we have developed. And then we carefully looked at all the image, all the all the patient data, and then see which one uh, which ones are more discriminating than the others. And on that basis, we picked um, eight uh, variables from here. And in summary, this, these features would say a mass is malignant, that's cancerous. Uh, it has irregular shape, blurry margin, potential microclassification, higher blood flow, lower uh, aspect ratio, and the smaller this new feature, CRD, indicative of more irregular shape. So when, then we, we wanted to see whether these features are, are good or not. So we use first hierarchical clustering. It just clusters a similar data. And it gave nine clusters. And these X and Y are the two malignant clusters. Others were healthy. But it, it, it dropped one feature or a couple of features. And it, it used six features, age, shape, marge, margin, the blood, and the other two features that we created. Then what we did was to see whether they are actually a good, good set. So we um, used self-organizing map. The, the beauty of self-organizing map is that we can organize the data in a, in a way that similar data are in the same lo similar locations. So when we did that, the top three clusters were all malignant using these variables that the hierarchical clustering gave us. And the bottom five, uh, four or five clusters, you can see AAA, they are the benign ones. So we are reasonably happy with that, that uh, set of um, inputs. And then we use the um, machine learning AI um, so the k nearest neighbor neurocentroid and linear discriminant analysis were quite common in that space. And we also did the um, neural networks. So what we found was the neural network had high 100% um, accuracy and it was the best, best um, model. And so we had improved model. Um, and importantly, it's a simpler model with only six features. And it's a reliable model because we actually optimized the neural network using self-organizing map again, where we clustered the correlated hidden neurons in the model. That way, we get a very simple harmonious, um, a parsimonious model. And when we, uh, when we remove the, our new feature, it uh, accuracy dropped down to 90.9%. And therefore, it was a very, very helpful feature that we gave. It improved the accuracy by 10%, this new feature that we introduced. So we found 9% 9, 9 diagnostic accuracy as a result of this new feature and the model, and overall a 4% enhancement. So in the current and upcoming studies, we are, we are using the, um, checking the ability of deep neural networks to extract meaningful features even even more, if possible, to get improve the specificity that's not 100% yet. Meaningful results, interpretive results, and these are the challenges that neural deep neural networks face at the moment. Although they might improve accuracy, but they cannot say how they got the results. So that the clinicians won't be impressed by that if they cannot trust it. So we are checking on that. And some of the publications um, from that work. So um, let me see. Now we're going to the. I will just uh, from the genetic side. I will just talk about only one of them, and uh, um, um, uh, genetic side. So here, I just, just to give a brief on the genomics and proteomics because otherwise I can't talk about it. Okay. So, <laughs> so I told you earlier that genes are you know the DNA it contains genes, right? They are actually this is the image of a cell. Uh, and the, in the middle, you can see the nucleus, and that's where the DNA is, right? It's like a 
pressure pressure <laughs> is protected so much and uh, when uh, when you need proteins as the copy of the gene required gene is copied because we don't want to damage the blueprint right so um, when that's copied then we say it, it's a, it's a, it's a gene is copied and then then it takes taken to a machine that makes proteins and then proteins are produced so these are the two things, genes and proteins, that's how it works. Okay? And if you look at a, 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 another way, another look at a cell, cell carries you know, many, many functions, like for example, defense against bacteria, virus, for example, metabolism, energy production, and so on. And everything is conducted done by this. This plot shows, a, a, it means that a lot of proteins are, are involved in that, in that critical function, right? So if you, if you look at this, uh, what's in, in here, what we see is a net Work of proteins, and they are, we are working to do whatever the task they have to do, right? So red meaning uh, it's highly active, and and then um, green meaning it's not uh, not active. So in our study, in the first one, we, we look at the this this side that how 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 how, how active the genes are, right? So for that, uh, people do microarray experiments, which I'm going to show you in a sec. So. Um, here we use blood, which is easier to get, easier to extract, and uh, it's gone into a to a microarray. This is a chip that can measure thirty thousand genes, a level of thirty thousand genes at the same time. Okay, um, so the, some some chemical reaction goes on, and you can take images. And in the image, if you zoom a particular part, you can see dot 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 dot. Each dot is a gene, an activity level of a gene. Right, you can imagine thirty thousand dots will be there on the screen, and 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 then um, in our study, um, we uh, data was provided by two hospitals in Norway, and one hundred twenty one samples with sixty seven cancer and fifty four benign, and there are eleven thousand data for genes because we still don't know some of the other genes and what they do. So, um, for that reason. We um, we uh, we use uh, seven thousand three hundred fifty one genes. That's our data set. Each person had this many genes, and this is very high dimensional data now, right? So, in the previous diagnostic studies, the accuracy was seventy nine point five percent, and they use seven hundred thirty eight. Differentially expressed. Differentially expressed means its um, activity level of a gene is different in the cancer compared to the healthy person. Healthy person. That's why it's called differentially expressed. So they found use 738 genes uh, and using support vector machines. Obviously, accuracy needed improvement. So our approach was to advance feature selection approach to drastically reduce features. And, and introduce a new CAT system. This is so important, 738, you know, and small sample, it's not a, it's not a good story for machine learning, right? So, um, so how do you do select a small set? So we propose this idea of a bi-biological filter, by bi meaning we filter twice, and using best first search um, with sub support vector machine. So idea is that we have a, a cancer data set, and we also have the patient data from healthy, patients and and we from the cancer data said we first remove um, genes that are not cancer and also not healthy maybe the person had flu maybe they had stress hormones or whatever other things that are not related to cancer so how do you do that first we get the cancer data set and then you know they divide into two segments and then see what are what are the shared genes here the shared would be the ones that actually cancer everything else would be some and also there will be some healthy genes or healthy also because some healthy functions also happening in the cancer person's body, right? So in the, so, um, so we wanted to first do that and then take the shared with and compare with the healthy ones and then remove all the healthy ones. That way we can get a purely cancer-related genes. So the, the, for this, we take this same set and then share with the healthy and then find these BC genes. We, we thought that it would still be quite high number of genes and we thought then, okay, let's we can do um, support vector machine that kind of create a high margin between two, um, two clusters. And we thought we could select a small set of highly discriminating genes from that, that, that way. So to do that, we, so now we have three data sets, cancer one, cancer two, and also healthy. So gene clustering, what we did was build the co-expression network, meaning we, uh, we find the correlation between each gene with every other gene, and this is more like a topological overlap matrix. Remember now the size of this is 7,350 7, times 7,350 size. 
is a huge matrix, right? Um, so if we did that, then we kind of see these kind of uh, um, connections, and then we have put a, a, a uh, spectral clustering because we have the, we use the correlation. So we kind of uh, 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 spectral clustering would would cluster all these genes that are similar. That means similar genes would be doing similar functions. That's what the idea. So it's heavily mathematical, but I'm just giving you the simple um, process. So when you apply spectral clustering, you can see some cluster like that, right? So now when we apply these to the cancer data set, we had 17 clusters of, uh, in cluster one and 16 here. And then we found five clusters were shared between the two. And then when we did the same, uh, same process to the healthy data set, and see we have found 15 clusters in the healthy data set, Gene clusters, and when we compared with these five clusters, there were two shared clusters. They were the healthy genes. Therefore, we had three cancer gene clusters, and now again, 415, which is better than 7,300, but still 415, we have only 112 patients, so it's not still not good. So, so um, but before that, we actually check, are, are these genes worth? I mean, is there, you know, are they really um, useful? So there's a de de website called David, Database for Annotation and Visualization and Discovery uh, on the web base. And then we kind of throw these data uh, genes into it and see what are the what their functions. So if you just look at this column, these are the genes that we have, only part of it, not all the 450 here, um, just to show what it is for you. And then the, just look at these two, uh, two columns. So this is the, all the genes that are enrolled in a particular function. If you look at some of these genes here, you can see their cell death, death uh, programmable cell death, because this, now the body is trying to kill cancer, cancer cells. So we know that these genes are realistic. And similarly, we check everything, and this, all these genes were quite in one way or the other related to cancer and uh, cancer processes. And the one gene, for example, because that K3 is a gene is featuring in every place. And we also the key values and everything is there too. Anyway, now we are confident that the genes are good, but we need to get them down. So we use, use the um, support vector machine. We, we first use the most, the first uh, best gene first, and the best two gene cluster, best three genes, and so on. That's why yeah. the best for search is, right? And then we up to up to about 13, we got about 88%. So we are reasonably happy. And this shows the, the SVM uh, accuracy uh, graph. So in about 13 genes, we have so now we have 13 genes. That's reasonably it's a good thing. And when we did the uh, cancer classification, we have five-fold cross-validation. And now the accuracy with the neural network and further optimized neural network is 94%. Compared to 79% with 13 genes, it's a, I thought it was a very good result. And so 94% accuracy with just 13 genes. So here are some publications from that and are we time time wise okay so um now i'm going to get you through a very quickly um, highlights of some interesting projects other projects that um, we are doing and the first one i'm going to look at dynamic modeling of cancer heterogeneity cancer is not only difficult to predict but it's also diagnosed it's also very heterogeneous that's the other issue you know it has no one one um, one uh, look it can be quite uh, different so what we do in this study is to look at the uh, multi-level cancer modeling all right, starting with genes and these proteins uh, model, and then we look at uh, the underlying processes where these proteins are involved, for example, cell growth, DNA repair, survival, cell death, and so on. So we, we look at them, and then they be combined, we relate them to high level cancer hallmarks. These are the kind of things clinicians would kind of you know, understand. The 10 cancer hallmarks have been. Uh, kind of identified recently, and they could be like uh, accumulating um, genetic mutations and avoiding cell, growth, cell death, and all the way going um, down to metastasis where the cancer goes to another place and latch onto some other tissue. So these are the high level hallmarks. And we develop a dynamic Boolean model uh, this is only a part of a model. It, it has a huge number of uh, proteins involved in it. And we identify seven cancer hallmarks at the moment. Um, we don't have enough information for the other, because research is still, you know, we need a lot of information, not just data, even information, you know, how, how the body works. 
we don't know that that so we identify it's a very painstaking process and here we aim to link genetic mutations from here to how they how they kind of translate into high level high level um, cancer hallmarks and the, so we can tackle heterogeneity in a more meaningful direct and transparent way so we are going from genotype to phenotype so another exciting work we did was the future proof vaccine development and computational framework for that uh, using that idea, we use a novel human TB vaccine. TB is a forgotten pandemic. Millions of people die every year. So, but we still don't have a, a human focused um, vaccine. So in, in this study, we use proteomics data. Um, so we want to do future proof, meaning that it will work for future as well. So we collected the protein, that is protein data for 159 strains of micro, is microbacterium tuberculosis, that's the MTB, um, TB bacteria reported in the last 30 years. So this bacteria has 4,000 genes, 4,000 proteins, like human had 30,000, bacteria has 4,000. And we, we assemble all that and we just want to make it future proof. So our approach um, used um, various neural networks, support vector machine, hidden Markov models and the Bayesian networks. Um, just to, uh, the idea is that how do we know? How do you want? We want to make, find a very effective vaccine, and we want to be very effective, very um, simple to um, develop, right? So what we did was we took took all the proteomics, all all those strains, and we did a comparative analysis to see what are the common ones, right? So out of four thousand, we kind of found two thousand. They are the most conserved proteins in the, in any bacteria. So we can kind of go into the center of all bacterial life to get get this information, right? So the 2000 were common to all of them. And then you, we used BLAST, which is an algorithm used, it's a web-based algorithm to find this. So we filtered those proteins and then we found a, a, a what we decided was to find the proteins that are in the surface surface of the bacteria because the human immune system can then work with that much more easily, right? So um, then we so cut down those proteins to smaller numbers of specific, you know, the surface exposed proteins. And then we wanted to find, even go further down using immunoinformatics, and we wanted to find oh, from these proteins the parts that are extremely virulent and humans uh, response system really love it or we really like to respond to. And these are called epitopes. And um, so these epitopes are very tiny pieces, okay? And very, very powerful. And uh, we, we call this, these are the virulent fragments. So we, we ultimately from 4,000, we came down to 25 these tiny fragments, epitopes. And then we developed a in silico uh, vaccine with 25 little pieces. And every piece is guaranteed to produce a strong response, right? And then we simulated, we simulated that response of the human immune system to that vaccine computationally. So we can see how it works. So from that, we can say that this solved many kind of challenges in vaccine development in general. This computation pipeline is simpler and more effective and compact, like 25 epitopes is the most com you know, compact you can think of, and can be used for other diseases and safe because we tested on the, on the human system and it doesn't create any reaction in the human, a known reaction in the human. And also broad spectrum because it now goes to the center of the bacterial life and all bacteria have these kind of, kind of epitopes that all of them can be affected, you know, all of them can be addressed. So that's why it's a broad spectrum and they are for future proof. And it'll be very effective for, um, it will produce more effective and safe COVID vaccine too. You know, that's a good thing to test. We are, we are thinking of testing, um, developing um, this uh, TB vaccine with the biotech lab in India um, and, and, and then see how it goes. But definitely it'd be nice to try a, a COVID vaccine as well. Um, another study uh, we're going to talk is about a Alzheimer's disease, um, deep neural network and explainable AI for early detection of Alzheimer's. It is going to be a web application and uh, um, idea here is that we have PET and MRI images. They do molecular and then volumetric kind of information and images. And then you know, what we want to do is to deep neural network using features and a deep neural network and explainable AI. 
deep neural network would take couple, take an image and say whether the person has Alzheimer's or normal or not. And the explainable AI using game theoretic um, ideas would ex would add more information into that results and using all this information that you find here for early, mild, and late, and also you know different stages of Alzheimer's, and that explainable AI would add information to it so that clinician can can get a better confidence on that. So. Um, uh, yeah, I have a couple of slides. I don't know whether I have time or not. So, so we're running out of time. Running out of time. Okay. So then, obviously, uh, one last thing is that we are also writing books, and my colleague and my husband, Professor Don Pelissi, recently published his book, "Chemical Mastery Equation for Large Biological Network: State State Space Expansion Methods Using AI." So um, I will finally say thank you to my collaborators, Professor Don and Mike Levin. I didn't get to talk about that work in uh, Tufts and Harvard in the USA. And um, Ali uh, from Breast Cancer, uh, Chanta in Regeneration, we didn't get to talk about it. Pooja for TB vaccine and Hisham for cancer modeling and Yiroshan for Alzheimer's. And thank you. Great, thank you very, very much for um, sharing all that research with us. It's absolutely <laughs> incredible Thank you. Um, what you've achieved so far. Um, so Alex has a question. Alex, do you want to ask it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Alex Devushin here from University of Canterbury. So I was yeah. quite curious about the genetic data that you used uh, in, 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 in to train your machine learning models. Uh, so this uh, mRNA and microRNA data, do you expect those uh, molecules to come from cancer cells or they're just blood tests and uh, in fact, they're coming from healthy cells? Uh, yeah, blood, we assume that the uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, what happens is cancer because the blood is, is very sensitive, right? So we want to see whether um, the expectation is that any diseases, you know, will have some sort of imprint on the blood. And so um, we use plasma and blood have shown that. And our study also showed that cancer, cancer patients, the healthy patients have different gene sig genetic signatures uh, that can be identified. In the blood test. So you, you didn't do any sort of uh, cellular filtering uh, and just took the blood test and then uh, yes. extracted uh, and did the RNA seq uh, and then looked at uh, messenger RNAs. Oh, okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's, see, that's what uh, did our collaborators also wanted to test because it's an easier one and less intrusive to uh, do. And in future, if this works, future it could be much easier to do this kind of uh, diagnosis. No, yeah, absolutely. If that works, that that would be amazing. But the tests that I've seen, they are mainly based on uh, cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA, not 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 on RNA. So it's 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 quite interesting that if it works with RNAs. Yeah. Any other questions? Because I I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So you obviously have a background in biology and an interest in biology. Um, for some of our students, for example, they come with a strong data science background and then they are looking to work in healthcare. What advice would, would you have for them? Yeah, yeah. Um, in, terms of, in terms of my background, actually, I didn't have a biological background. You know, I did engineering. And when you and I was growing up, after year 10 in school, if you're good in math, you go to math stream and you drop biology. So after year 10 in high school, I didn't do any biology, right? But I, I, my sheer interest in biology, I don't know what is going on within our bodies. You know, we are living in a body without knowing much about it. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense, you know. So, so that's how I kept the interest going all the time. And when I actually I told myself, I told myself AI too, you know. <laughs> my, I didn't mm -hmm. go in a computer science program, uh, but I told myself AI, and I. I teach myself biology and I guess the interest is the key. I mean, if you're interested, you will find a way to do it. Um, still, you know, even if you're not as interested, it's still, you know, it's good to understand because you cannot do medical biology research without knowing biology. Otherwise, it stays very superficial and people don't trust that data. You can't interpret it. You can't talk about it. So there's no shortcut, but at least you need to get some, you know, uh, understanding. So there are basic information available in uh, you know even youtube you can find out in, uh, you know find out about what, what genes proteins protein networks gene networks diseases and genetic 
basis of diseases, at least you need kind of you know basic understanding. So that can be done, and help is available. Information is available, and then there are courses available too. Even free courses available that you can attend. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Kevin, um, I think that this research is interesting because it was sort of a direction that PDH was keen to go in in the beginning, and and then PDH veered off. Um, so, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I guess. I mean, this is the this is the really exciting area for personalised healthcare going forward, and I think. In our early days, we, we certainly looked at it as an area of interest. We were motivated pretty strongly by things that we could see in practice and being tested within the New Zealand health system within a pretty short time frame. So we found that a lot of the genomic side of things is still at this stage of exciting discoveries, but not quite at this stage of uh, affordable rollout. And so, so I guess, you know, it, it's just a different different part of the research life cycle um but this is this is awesome work that's obviously got amazing potential for for changing the way that we care for individuals any other questions or comments from the audience everyone's very quiet um i'd be interested for the healthcare people that are on the call I'd be interested to know how easy or difficult it is to work with data science people. Hmm. Mariam, are you there? I know Mariam was interested. She's a clinical specialist in the hospital. No. no. Very quiet. Alex, would you like to say a couple of words about um what you're currently doing? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I, I can come back, comment a little bit on how uh, easy or hard it is to work with uh, health professionals. So <laughs> usually, I, I think it's fine, but uh, they are busy people. They have conferences on weekends and things like that. But uh, yeah, in, in in our experience, we are collaborating with oncologists uh, across the country, and they share their data with us. I mean, there is obviously the uh, ethical and legal uh, aspects of that, and you need to sign all the uh, all the agreements uh, to, to get access to that data. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you, usually it's fine, and all the hospitals have cancer data. But uh, yeah, so my interest here is cancer evolution. So we we are studying uh, within within patient uh, cancer cancer progression and evolution from genomic data. So specifically focusing, so we're collaborating with people at Oakland. They are mostly focusing on uh, single cell DNA-seq. We are developing methods for single cell RNA-seq. And uh, well, the, 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 the first question was whether there is any evolutionary signal uh, in single cell RNA-seq data. And we demonstrated that there is. And now it was uh, picked up by a group in Seattle at Fred Hatch Cancer Research Center and a group at Yale who further showed that, uh, yes, you can reconstruct evolutionary history using uh, RNA-seq data, single cell RNA-seq data. But the clinical application of that, uh, well, first biological application of that is to understand how cancers grow and develop. So when you think uh, in terms of a patient and you know something like a metastatic disease, then the question an oncologist might be wondering about what was the uh, uh, the genomic change or epigenomic change maybe that led to uh, the metastasis formation. And those questions can be answered by reconstructing evolutionary history, by looking at the ancestral states of those uh, of, uh, of the cells that you have currently in the patient and you know linking that to time. So the other thing that we are working on is, is timing. For instance, when there is a patient and there are maybe a couple of metastases and the clinician is wondering which happened first. So by timing those events, uh, we can, uh, 
we can disentangle that. But ultimately, the goal is to work uh, towards drug targets at the personalized level. So you, using that to identify uh, druggable alternations uh, on the um, uh, on the personalized individual level linked to that to drugs uh, or, or drug scenarios. Uh, so that you know the, the the patient can be treated in a way that uh, reduces the chance of developing resistance, which uh, uh, you know uh, it's it, it, it's a you know evolutionary game between cancer cells and the, and yeah. the treatment. And what you want to avoid is developing uh, super cells that uh, gather around uh, all the treatments and became resistant and. Uh, you know, eventually it grew to the extent when it it, it is deadly to the patient. Uh, so yeah, that's the the ultimate goal of this evolutionary approach is to to personalize healthcare and personalize cancer care. Thanks, Alex. I think it. You know, what I'm seeing is that there is a heap of things going on in New Zealand, and right. we really do need to get together a lot more. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And share absolutely hundred percent, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, when when I was when I when I saw RNAs, I got super excited. And uh, you know, there is currently an RNA platform in in in, in making. They need uh, to include a lot more AI. Than they currently yeah, do. That's right. which... <laughs> Maybe we can make use of this opportunity and and create something, a forum or a group or something, and then kind of evolve that. You know, uh, this is about this is evolution evolutionary space. So we can think of that. Um, yeah, I think perhaps, it's, it's, you know, find a place to meet up where mm. we're meeting up anyway. Mm. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's something new. Mm. We need to take advantage of things that yeah, um, yeah. already exist, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yep, just, yep certainly. Um, I think we, we are running out of time. So would anyone like to make any closing comments or does anyone have any final questions before we sign off no okay so um i'd just like to thank the audience that have been here today um and particularly thank the speakers um i think it was really great to have the overview and then delve deeper into specific research projects so it was a very, very nice combination. Um, I'd also like to thank Janet from AIRA for organising the event. So thank you all very much and stay in touch with each other. Yes. Right. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Janet, and thank you, everyone. And perhaps we can continue some conversations afterwards uh, sometime. Thanks. Thanks.